Chapter Seven of Old Friends and New Fancies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Old Friends and New Fancies, an imaginary sequel to the novels of Jane Austen, by Sybil G. Brinton. Chapter Seven. The Darcys travelled slowly and they had not been at home for long before a letter from their cousin who had gone direct to london from bath was received by darcy colonel fitzwilliam briefly related what had occurred after their departure his application to ferrers and yates with its more or less successful result and his totally unsuccessful visit to mrs grant he omitted of course all reference to the second part of yates's conversation with lady catherine and stated his few facts with the smallest amount of comment adding that he was grateful to his cousins for their kindness in the affair but in the circumstances he thought it would be better not to return to pemberley for the present but to try to occupy his mind with some work he had therefore accepted an offer made to him by one of his brother's officers to collaborate in writing a history of his regiment and he proposed to remain in london where he would have access to manuscripts and authorities darcy need have no fear that he would not correspond as regularly as usual and he would call in at the hearsts while they remained in town so that he would be in continual touch with as he said in conclusion the best friends a man ever had elizabeth sighed over this letter but consoled herself presently with the thought that mrs grant and miss crawford might possibly be in town during the summer Darcy, on the other hand, was well satisfied with it, deeming that his cousin had acted with perfect uprightness, and he begged Elizabeth to give up the idea of trying to bring them all together at some future time. Fitzwilliam, my dear, is of an age when he can be trusted to manage his own affairs, as this proves to us, he said to her. I do not think it proves much, except that Aunt Catherine is the cruel, domineering old woman we always knew her to be, replied Elizabeth poor robert to think of his being so abominably treated of course a true honest man as he is was powerless among these insufferable people who have not a word of truth amongst them elizabeth indeed felt acutely disappointed at such a disastrous and unforeseen ending to her hopes she blamed herself bitterly for her share in the disaster and again regretted having persuaded miss crawford to come to the reception she had written to mary according to promise at the first opportunity but not for more than a week after their return home was an answer received and then it was a disappointment like all the rest merely a note brief and tremulous acknowledging mrs darcy's kindness and apologies begging that no more might be said as to the offence and breaking off with assurance of the writer's goodwill but of her inability to express herself at greater length the only sign of the real mary appeared in the postscript i will write again by and by dear mrs darcy if you will not mind very stupid letters the lines of the note clearly showed the writer's shaken health although her pride forbade her to make it an excuse elizabeth was grieved and felt herself for the time being repulsed she resolved to send after a time a cheerful letter on different subjects which might re-establish their friendship on new ground so that the painful memories which miss crawford at present associated with the darcy family might by degrees be eradicated these anxieties occupying her thoughts and her time being taken up with her children and with georgiana who had returned to pemberley in greatly improved health and spirits she still did not fail to remark the absence of any news of lady catherine for she had fully expected a speedy communication announcing the lady's triumph over miss crawford and ignoring all that had followed it when her husband therefore in opening a letter one morning observed that it was from his aunt she was prepared for something considerably more disagreeable than its contents proved to be the letter began by announcing lady catherine's recent return home with her daughter and the extreme pleasure of mr and mrs collins and of all their neighbours in seeing them again the worthy rector and his wife had come up to rosings to pay their respects on the very first evening mrs jenkinson 
had not yet come back from her vacation she had in fact written to ask leave to stay for another week which was excessively inconvenient as dear anne depended upon her so much anne's sensibility was indeed very great she might not have inherited her mother's strength of character but she had such warm affections they sometimes led her to form attachments to people who proved unworthy of such devotion there had just been an unfortunate instance of that during their stay at bath darcy who had been reading the letter out loud to his wife and sister hesitated at this point but elizabeth urged him to go on saying that georgiana knew all about the ferrers and was as anxious as herself to learn whether their reign was over you and elizabeth have probably heard something of the regrettable termination to my reception on your last evening in bath the young lady whom elizabeth was so obstinately anxious for me to patronize must have acted at some former time with extreme imprudence to say the least of it though i really do not feel it to be my duty to investigate the rights and wrongs of the matter still the information i received was so positive that i was bound to act upon it and to point out to her that i regretted having brought her into my immediate circle of friends i think i may say that she or at any rate her sister admitted the justice of my remarks there i hoped the matter would have ended but immediately afterwards i learned that the very persons from whom i had received this friendly warning about miss crawford had been themselves acting towards me in a scandalously hypocritical and underhand manner you will guess that i referred to the robert ferrers and miss Steele. i cannot enter into particulars of their conduct suffice it to say that for all the latter part of their stay in bath it has been a continual course of deception of nefarious and vulgar schemes for their own aggrandizement they have traded upon my kindness and upon the warm regard which my poor innocent-hearted anne displayed towards miss Steele, to foster the most impudent designs never have i been so mistaken in people whom i regarded as deserving of my interest never have i met with such vile ingratitude you may imagine that i lost no time in sending for the whole family and informing them that our acquaintance was at an end for the reasons i have given and naturally i declined to listen to any defence miss Steele was utterly confounded but mrs ferrars seeing that her whole plot was exposed showed herself in her true colours she lost control of herself and used expressions more insolent than any one has ever dared to do in my presence indeed she was so determined to be heard that it was only by leaving the room myself and sending my footman to show them out that i was able to rid myself of their presence the man is a mere weak fool i could see that by the way he ineffectually tried to control his wife but even he seemed to have no sense of the impropriety of her conduct and her sisters it is easily conjectured that after such a shock as this all enjoyment in bath for me was entirely at an end we should have left immediately but that anne was too unwell on hearing what had happened to travel for another week my indignation at the whole affair is still beyond words darcy paused and elizabeth asked is that all the letter fitzwilliam yes he replied that is she signed her name there but there is a postscript which is evidently intended for your perusal elizabeth took the letter which he handed to her and read were it not that out of pure perversity elizabeth always chooses to act exactly the opposite to my advice i should suggest that you proceed very cautiously in any further dealings you may have with the young lady i mentioned above elizabeth flushed deeply and laid down the letter but immediately took it up again and re-read lady catherine's version of the ferrer's defeat meanwhile georgiana was eagerly asking what does aunt catherine mean darcy she writes strangely does she not how can those people have nefarious schemes or designs against her she does not say how she knew they had i hardly understand it all said darcy but you know your aunt has often been disappointed in people before when they have desired more of her favour than she was prepared to give yes she takes great fancies and then forgets about people returned georgiana but she really seems to be dreadfully angry this time elizabeth says that you and she did not like those people the ferrers no we did not for we considered them undesirable 
replied darcy and whatever reason your aunt has for quarrelling with them undoubtedly it is well she should have done so georgiana perceived that she was not to hear more about the ferrers and dropped the subject which in fact was what darcy wished for it was a distasteful one to him for they had aroused his dislike more than most of his aunt's protégés and he was glad to hear they had fallen from favour without being interested in the reason for it elizabeth was quite aware of this and accordingly refrained from any further discussion of her aunt's letter with her husband she could not forbear a little private smile over the exposure of the impudent designs the nature of which she had quickly surmised in the circumstances she thought they had hardly merited such severe strictures as those passed on them by lady catherine and but for mrs ferrer's unpardonable conduct towards miss crawford elizabeth might have spared her some pity for the manner of her dismissal from pulteney street georgiana took an early opportunity of asking elizabeth about the references to miss crawford that is your friend of whom you told me is it not elizabeth i wonder what really happened and why aunt catherine speaks of her so harshly it seems very unkind it was very unkind georgiana of course aunt catherine was entirely misinformed she listened to some malicious gossip and was terribly rude to miss crawford at the end of the evening after we left i heard about it from robert who stayed later than we did and the worst of it is that in consequence miss crawford feels deeply wounded i fear as regards the whole family oh i am so sorry what a pity it is cannot anything be done surely you will be able to put it all right again some time will you not i hope so yes of course i shall do whatever is possible i should be so extremely sorry to lose sight of her now she must be charming from all you say commented georgiana and then asked rather shyly and with a deep blush did cousin robert like her too yes he liked her very much i think you know she played the harp and he is so fond of anything to do with music yes i know said georgiana and added in a low voice i remember he would always much rather have listened to my playing than have talked to me do not let yourself grieve georgiana said elizabeth kissing the young girl's fair brow you know that robert has the greatest possible regard for you and you will find next time you meet that you are the best of friends georgiana smiled rather sadly she often felt that she must have not only fallen in the estimation of a cousin she revered but that she must also be possessed of no qualities capable of inspiring affection and what was worse of no heart of her own to give elizabeth understood her well and tried often to give her more self-confidence and to raise her lowly opinion of herself but though she was growing less reserved and more disposed little by little to trust her own judgments the old habits of timidity of reliance on the guidance of those whom she loved were still strong in her elizabeth would often refuse to decide a thing for her but when she was helped to weigh it in the balance to judge it all by the standards available her choice could always be recommended for discretion and clear-sightedness the month of may was now nearly halfway through and the time was approaching when james morland was expected to pay a visit to his friends at pemberley so much of their stay at bath had been productive of disappointment that they looked back upon their acquaintance with this young man as its one circumstance of unalloyed pleasure darcy whose regard for him had grown very warm had received letters from home which enabled him prior to leaving bath to inform morland that a living in his gift would shortly be vacant and that he would have the pleasure of offering it to morland when the time came this important communication had been received by the young clergyman with a depth of joy and gratitude which had increased the darcy's satisfaction in being able to assist him the living though not a rich one would suffice for his needs as he possessed some capital advanced by his father and its situation in a hilly and bracing country district made it most desirable for a person whose health like his own had to be considered the conversation between himself and darcy which had been very short had taken place only the day before the latter's departure and morland still scarcely realizing his good fortune had hurried round to the hotel the following morning 
to repeat his acknowledgments to both his friends and to make his adieu there was time only for a few words to be exchanged at the house door and morland found it difficult to express himself fluently on a subject which lay so near his heart but elizabeth and her husband set him at his ease with a few kind remarks repeating cordially an invitation already given that he come and stay with them on the conclusion of his visit to the portin scales since their return home the resignation of the old rector at kimpton the living in question had been made public he was to leave within a few weeks so that morland's visit would afford him as the rector designate an opportunity of getting to know the place and of meeting some of his future parishioners pemberley was not in the parish for kimpton was eighteen miles away but the link between the two places had always been strong and the distance was frequently bridged for desborough park the home of the bingleys was the principal house in kimpton parish and only a mile and a half from the parsonage house morland's pleasure was extreme on hearing that his nearest neighbours would be the brother-in-law and favourite sister of mrs darcy next to being within a stone throw of the darcys themselves it was the best thing imaginable morland arrived at pemberley late one afternoon just in time to prepare for dinner and was introduced to miss darcy when they all assembled in the drawing-room before the meal georgiana's intense shyness generally caused her to appear at a disadvantage with strangers but there was something in the young man's open countenance and pleasing unaffected manners that attracted every one to him at first sight and they were soon chatting together completely at their ease morland was deeply interested in everything that he could learn of his future home and asked eager questions of his hosts georgiana had been so lately staying at desborough and had while there so frequently called on old dr and mrs taylor that she was able to give more particulars of the house and garden than her brother and sister were able to recollect the evening passed quickly away with conversation and music and morland learned that on the following morning the whole party were to drive over to desborough park to dinner starting early that they might have time to walk through the village and inspect the church and parsonage as well the weather proved propitious and the drive through some of the most beautiful vales of derbyshire was agreeable to all but especially delightful to morland feeling as he did that he was within reach of the goal he had so long desired restored health and the power to do the work he loved amid congenial surroundings it was in vain that darcy not wishing to raise his hopes too high told him that the parish was very scattered and the roads bad that the climate was exceedingly cold and the distant cottages were almost inaccessible in stormy weather that some of the farmers were people of a very independent way of thinking difficult to get on with he could discover no drawback only fresh incentives to throw himself into his task elizabeth commended him for his enthusiasm but added a sly reminder that he might be disappointed in the house large rambling and picturesque though it may seem when tenanted by the tailors and their seven children it would she feared be an inconvenient residence to a bachelor it will be too big i have no doubt responded morland but you know i need not furnish more than a part of it besides i intend as soon as i am thoroughly settled to have my sister sarah to stay with me if she can be spared from home georgiana was interested in hearing of the sister and james morland at her request gave an account of his home at fullerton and of his brother and sisters eight besides himself and catherine who was now mrs henry tilney catherine was evidently the favourite there was a smile and a lightening of the eye when he spoke of her he wished it had been possible for her to come and help him with his settling in but they lived such a great distance away woodston was forty miles away from bath quite at the other end of somerset mr darcy's chaise and four rolled through the village of kimpton not long after twelve o'clock and paused to put down its owner his sister and his young guest there was so much to see but georgiana was an untiring walker and intended staying with the gentlemen until the carriage could be sent back to bring them to desborough in time for an early dinner elizabeth drove on for another two miles and was presently alighting at the door of a handsome modern house built in the italian style and being warmly welcomed by bingley and jane whom she had not seen for some weeks 
Bingley, on hearing what had become of the rest of the party, immediately decided to walk down to meet them, and the sisters strolled into the garden, for the weather was remarkably warm and sunny for that time of year, and they could venture to seat themselves upon a bench that was sheltered by an angle of the house, whence a beautiful view was obtained of the wide-spreading park, with its chestnut trees in full bloom, and clumps of pink and white hawthorns. Desborough was not so imposing and extensive a place as Pemberley, but it was pleasant and homelike, and the grounds were particularly delightful, including, as they did, an orchard, a shrubbery, and lawns and flower borders laid out in a series of terraces which sloped towards the park. The Bingleys took great pleasure in their garden, and had made many additions and improvements during the two years of their occupancy. "'I am overjoyed that you are come, Lizzie began jane for i have so much to tell and ask i have not seen you since we brought georgiana home nearly a month ago do you really think she is better elizabeth warmly assented and declared that georgiana seemed in greater spirits than she had been for many months jane anxiously inquired after fitzwilliam and elizabeth made out as good an account of him as she could but as she was naturally not at liberty to mention what had passed at bath she could not perfectly satisfy jane as to his well-being choosing a safer subject she talked of mr morland praised his modesty ability and good sense and repeated her conviction that the bingleys would find him a thoroughly agreeable neighbour jane listened with interest and promised every kind of help and support to the new rector who was to come with such strong recommendations but she was clearly a little preoccupied and elizabeth seeing this asked what news she had to communicate i'm afraid it's not very good news began jane hesitatingly but you will have guessed it i expect i have had a letter from lydia she is going abroad elizabeth fancy almost immediately poor lydia wickham's regiment is ordered to the west indies and he insists on her going with him i'm not sure why it should be poor lydia returned elizabeth smiling you have such a terribly compassionate heart jane i should think lydia would like the west indies very much though she probably dreads the voyage oh no she does not think she will like them at all it is so hot there and she cannot bear the idea of being waited on by negro servants she says there is only one consolation very few of the ladies of the regiment are going there will not be more than six of them and no one as young as herself since so many are staying behind i should have thought she could have arranged to do the same though i confess i think it is much better she should be with wickham yes you are right i believe elizabeth she says she would rather have stayed in england and that wickham declares he does not particularly want her only he cannot afford to keep up an establishment for her at home while he is abroad jane sighed it is very sad that they talk like that to one another i only hope they do not mean it elizabeth preferred to waive this question and continued i suppose she goes on to ask you for money jane admitted that this was so but said that lydia would need a suitable outfit for the west indies and everything of that kind was very expensive it appeared she added that lydia was anxious to come to derbyshire before she went away if a remittance for the journey could be sent but jane had not made any response to the suggestion no i do not think that is at all necessary elizabeth remarked well jane of course i will give you some bank notes to send with your own on the usual condition that lydia does not know from whom they come but i only wish one could believe that they will be used for paying debts to the newcastle tradespeople of which there are sure to be plenty could you not persuade her to give you a statement of what she owes you could then perhaps arrange for some of them to be paid off first i will try i will ask bingley about it but it is very difficult to help lydia the way one would like she does expect the most extraordinary things what do you think of her inviting kitty to go to the west indies with her my father of course paying all expenses i am past feeling any astonishment at lydia's demands elizabeth said but i hope kitty had too much good sense even to think such a thing possible oh no i think she knew it would not be allowed though perhaps the idea was tempting to her poor kitty 
but she had her promised visit here to plead as an excuse she is coming you know towards the end of next month it has been arranged then i am so glad to hear it she must come to pemberley and she and georgiana will enjoy being together again yes indeed but i hope she will stay with me until the autumn i wanted her to have come a little earlier but she has received an invitation from some people called knightley in london which she is very desirous of accepting and my father sees no objection yes i know of whom you mean i think they are a friend of my uncle and aunt gardiner's and live in brunswick square i fancy it is not those knightleys but relations of theirs still we shall hear all about it very soon for i am expecting a letter from kitty at any moment to give me her direction in london and to tell me when she will be ready to leave for bingley is to go to fetch her is bingley going to town then i wonder if it could possibly be arranged for him to escort georgiana darcy had thought of going but he would be very glad not to if bingley would not find it any inconvenience i'm sure bingley would be delighted she is going to the hearst is she not i have heard mention of it yes mrs hurst and caroline have both written begging for a long visit from her i do not think it can be for more than a month as aunt catherine is sure to want her to go on to rosings when she hears she is so near georgiana does not like being away from home for long nor do we like to spare her i can quite understand that she has such a sweet disposition such sympathy and brightness and intelligence that it is a joy to have her companionship and you have improved her so much elizabeth at one time i thought her very difficult to approach but her manners have gained so much ease and elegance that every one must be charmed with her from the first meeting i often think fitzwilliam must regret what he has lost my dear jane let me assure you for the twentieth time that he does not regret it nor can he be said to have lost what he never possessed their hearts were never united but now you will see that each will marry happily and their old friendship will survive unimpaired if you had seen fitzwilliam at bath you would have wasted no regrets on him now shall we walk about a little i want to discover if your lilacs are further advanced than ours three o'clock brought back the remainder of the party and mr morland was introduced to mrs bingley and found her a most sympathizing listener to his enthusiasm over his new home he was full of plans and was interested in everything from the beautiful little church down to the honeysuckle growing over the rectory porch darcy had promised him to have certain repairs and renovations made as soon as the taylor family should have quitted the house and faulty chimneys and new wallpapers formed topics for a kind of discussion which bingley thoroughly enjoyed and he would have presented his young guest with the contents of several rooms at desborough and the greater part of the stables if there had been the slightest chance of his accepting them there was not time to do more than begin on these important subjects today for by half past four the visitors had to be in the carriage again but the proposal that bingley should take georgiana on her journey to london was brought forward and approved of by all concerned bingley was also going to his sister's house and it was immaterial to him what day he arrived there or how long he had to wait in london for kitty bennett he thought he had heard something about a ball for which kitty wished to stay but was uncertain about the date it was decided that their next letters from their relations in town should determine the time of their departure End of chapter seven